Okay, I think uh, we will start. Uh, there may be other people joining as we go along, but I think Zoom has uh, admitted uh, the people who were in the waiting room. Uh, welcome everyone, bienvenue tout le monde. Uh, my name is Thomas Junot. I am an associate professor here at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Uh, today, we are very happy to have an event on Libya, uh, which uh, is, is a topic that I had been meaning to, to, to cover in SIPS for, for a while now, since I've always felt that, that we've really neglected, uh, we in Canada and the West and NATO, uh, what has been happening in the country over the last few years. About a year ago or something like that, uh, Imad got in touch with me um, to let me know that he was now in Canada. Uh, and, and for me, that was great news that we have more Middle East experts in this country because we really do not have uh, enough or a lot. Um, and uh, out of that, those first conversations came eventually an invitation to my podcast on which Imad was a guest uh, in the fall, if I recall correctly, and now an invitation uh, to an event in SIPS. Uh, I was initially hoping for that event to be in person, uh, but for uh, un uh, unfortunate reasons that everybody understands that was not uh, possible. So uh, on that, uh, I'm very happy to introduce Imad Eddin Badi who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, one of the most prominent analysts on Libya. If you do not follow him on Twitter, I strongly suggest that you do. Imad was just recently in Libya uh, and, and had some very interesting observations on that. So today he will talk about uh, evolutions uh, in Libya since 2011, prospects, prospects moving forward. He'll look a bit at the domestic context, the regional context. He will speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and after that, we'll have a Q&A. Once we get there, I'll, I'll explain how that will uh, proceed. So on that, uh, Imad, thank you very much, and uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Thomas. Uh, I'd like to thank, again, SIPS and the University of Ottawa for extending an invitation, and uh, you, and obviously all those attending as well. Uh, so I'll share my screen, uh, because I did prepare a PowerPoint slide for this. I think you can see it now, normally. Right? Yeah. All right, perfect. Full screen? So, yeah. Perfect. All right. So uh, obviously, it's a bit of a daunting task to kind of jam uh 12 years now or, or 11 or 12 years into a 20 minute presentation but uh what i'll roughly try and tackle through a non-exhaustive uh in a way presentation is our three angles let's say so first how did we get here because libya kind of only came sporadically to the headlines i think it's been ignored a lot of in domestic media and some countries it only popped back after 2011 very briefly 2014-16 with the migration crisis and then potentially also if you follow terrorism uh, is established the footprint in the country and then in 2019 with our third civil war so to speak uh, but in international foras no one really knows what happened there so uh, there's a domestic side to that story but there's also an international side uh, to that story so the second part is kind kind of covers a timeline or perhaps the reasons why the internationalization happened the way it did um third and this is what i like generally to do is having a kind of retrospective look at the different mostly multilateral bilateral endeavors to broker peace in the country so what initiatives were there to actually bring sort of a a, a solution to the conflict most of which have unfortunately failed uh, i'd say and then the kind of contemporary question uh, basically that is more contem contemporary is, is the the idea of elections and this is the current conundrum in Libya uh, are elections the way out of the current uh, crises basically so that's roughly the session outline um, it's just meant to guidepost you through what I'm going to say there are a few slides but I'm happy to send them over if anyone's interested but uh, in any case so how did we get here uh, apologies for the worthy slide but it is it is 10 years or 12 years that I'm trying to sum up here. So Libya, 2011, uh, the story of the NATO interventions. Obviously, there was a NATO intervention in 2011 that supported uh, rebels in overthrowing then uh, Muammar Gaddafi. What that story perhaps obfuscated to a certain extent is the extent to which uh, that intervention in and of itself was fragmented, plagued by divisions, and also had a more 
overt narrative to it that uh, masks a little bit the covert narratives to it. There are obviously a lot of disagreements within NATO countries themselves. Canada actually played a prominent role during that intervention. The head of the operation to uh, Libya was uh, Canadian. Some argue that this was symptomatic of, of uh, the differences between Europeans and Americans, so that Canada was kind of the consensus uh, player in that uh, in that spot. Uh, but obviously, this is a, a speculation and not and not a set uh, set fact. But in any case, that architecture, so to speak, uh, amalgamated different types of uh, military operations that were launched by several countries, including the U.S., the U.K., France, and Canada, most prominently. The U.S. withdrew very early on, at least in the military component, and decided to lead from behind. Um, and it did actually lead from behind. Arguably, the NATO intervention in its military goal was, uh, to a certain extent, successful in that it did uh, protect civilians, arguably. There was a lot of literature around that, but it's perhaps the day after uh, that wasn't really planned for. Um, another facet of things is the root causes of the internationalization uh, that we see today is actually from the NATO intervention itself. A lot of groups, rebel groups, receive support bilaterally from countries, and not just Western countries, but also uh, Gulf countries back then on the ground. Uh, and that those that seed kind of a fragmentation is what paved the way to a certain extent for the internationalization of the conflict that we saw thereafter. Uh, so after 2011, Libya fell off the map uh, a little bit. We had very successful national elections that happened in uh, 2012, uh, with over 60 percent of the population actually uh, voting, uh, not the population of eligible voters, sorry. Um, but in any case, afterwards, the differences between those factions and also differences more internationally over the kind of best blueprint for governance in Libya uh, fanned the flames for the crises that happened afterwards. So you had, particularly in the Gulf, differences between, on the one hand, I would say Qatar, and on the other hand, uh, the UAE over what type of governance or what model of governance should be adopted by these countries and also which groups should be accommodated in kind of uh, power, uh, in, in power positions. And that really toxified Libyan politics domestically, but also because these uh, these entities or these states actually had the direct, had directly supported rebel groups, it also militarized uh, sort of, or exacerbated the militarization and the hybridization of Libya's security sector or military sector. So a lot of groups that were, whose support kind of was supposed, supposed the, the support too was supposed to fade away after 2011, they did, they still received support for kind of narrow goal, narrower goals after uh, the NATO intervention. And this culminated in 2014 in a civil war. Uh, again, we relapsed back into a civil war. Uh, Libya became institutionally uh, divided, uh, again, I would say, uh, there was an absence of American ownership that partly played into that, failure to plan after the NATO intervention, and Abu Dhabi and Qatar primarily, I would say, at, uh, at that stage were the main patrons of local groups that actually led to the collapse of the transition. So in 2015, that situation became unsustainable, but it didn't become unsustainable because Libya was... Uh, too unstable, uh, domestically speaking, for European countries, but for, for reasons that were kind of adjacent to Libyan politics. And by here, but with that, I mean migration and terrorism. Uh, you had the migration crisis, so to speak, and uh, a number of migrants arriving to Italian shores, which have and has and still has even to this day kind of an impact on how they perceive uh, Libya. And you had also ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, that established a footprint in the coastal city of, of, of Sir. So the situation of institutional division in Libya became unsustainable because international countries that wanted to resolve those issues of terrorism and migration needed a state counterpart to actually be their, their interlocutor in the country. Uh, and that manifested as the Libyan political agreement that was meant to reconcile this institutional divide, re, uh, 
reunite the country and bring about a government of national accord that was set up in the capital and actually arrived in the capital in March of 2009, uh, 2016, but actually failed to, uh, I would say, uh, unify the country. Part of the reason it failed to unify the country was the fact that it was very corrupt on the one hand, but on the other hand, the same interventionism that I mentioned earlier didn't stop. You still had foreign countries, I would argue most prominent amongst them in this case was actually the United Arab Emirates that was very uh, hawkish in its intervention in Libya and backed uh, Khalifa Haftar, the figurehead, I would say, of the counter-revolutionary current in Libya or the, the reinventing the old status quo, let's say, uh, bringing about kind of new, the old narrative of, of Gaddafi in a new persona with uh, kind of the authoritarian stability uh, argument and the idea, well, that most of the revolutionary failures were due to Islamists having a control uh, in the country. And this is not a, I would say, a narrative that is exclusively Libya centric. It's a narrative that played out in several other countries, including Egypt back then, but also Tunisia, I would say today as well. Uh, and that's roughly the status quo that prevailed. Uh, kleptocracy sort of in Tripoli, uh, warlord consolidating power in uh, Eastern Libya, and then subsequently in, so in Southern Libya, uh, Migration and terrorism were dealt with, although in a very ad hoc and I would say inherently flawed fashion. So deals with the Libyan Coast Guard to just intercept migrants and get them back to Libya. IS was militarily defeated, but the root causes for their ability to establish a footprint in Libya weren't really dealt with. So it's still a threat today. And uh, a new kind of informal, I would say, power sharing uh, idea came about then. And this was the idea of actually having Khalifa Haftar share power with uh, whoever was stronger uh, in Western Libya. And in for the roughly the 2016, seven, or 2016, 19 period, that was back then at least the GNA, Governor of National Corps, Prime Minister Faiz al -Sabraj. But uh, this idea of having that power sharing uh, kind of blueprint come about was upended when Khalifa Haftar launched an offensive on Western Libya uh, on April 2019. Part of the reason for that is the guy just doesn't like to play uh, politics uh, in general. Uh, he also, his calculus was also that he could control the entirety of the territory. He had local deals with local armed groups to do that. Uh, another was that he also still had international support and informally had a green light from the US to do it and do it quickly from John Bolton back then. So those, all those narratives kind of led to the collapse of this power sharing blueprint. And we entered, I would say, a new phase uh, in the Libyan conflict with the relapse of the, into a third civil war uh, with heavy, heavy internationalization. Um, obviously the deals that Haftar had brokered and kind of the, the ease with which he portrayed being able to uh, control the entirety of the Libyan territory, that, didn't happen. And it was almost, I would say, expected because territorially speaking, if you look at Libya, even on a world map, it's very vast as a territory. So launching an offensive from kind of Eastern and Southern Libya to control Western Libya meant that you needed a lot of, first of all, ground forces to do that. And also you needed a lot of international support in, in the Libyan case. Most of our weaponry that existed from the Gaddafi era was very old and wouldn't really be useful for that. And that's part of the reason why uh, then you had two countries that weren't really prominent players that actually emerged, I would say, as almost power brokers afterwards. And those were Russia and Turkey. So Russia, on the one hand, leveraged Haftar's military setbacks and inserted itself in the, in the Libyan conflict. Uh, it deployed the, the infamous kind of private military contractors or, or a group known as the Wagner Group and aerial defense system to kind of help him out with his offensive. And on the other hand, Turkey also inserted in the, itself in the Libyan conflict. And it leveraged the, I would say, the fact that the government of national accord then was internationally abandoned almost uh, to sign two memorandums of understanding. One on military cooperation. So I'll help you out since you're in a tough spot with this offensive. But in exchange, you sign a maritime demarcation agreement that actually, I would say, embroiled Libya in an entirely different dimension of, of another conflict, which is the Eastern Mediterranean. 
conflict uh, vis-a-vis Crete and Greece and a whole block of states that contest, I would say, Turkey's interpretation of uh, maritime demarcations, etc. cetera. Um, so those interventions, I would say, offset one another to a certain extent. Uh, there was an informal ceasefire that prevailed uh, for a few months at the end of 2019, but then Russia and Turkey negotiated bilaterally, sidelining uh, completely almost their local partners, and the Russians pulled out and Haftar's uh, offensive completely collapsed in a matter of, of not days, but actually hours, uh, basically. It took 48 hours from when the Wagner group uh, went back to central Libya and southern Libya for the uh, entire offensive to actually collapse. So this is the Libyan story of internationalization, and that's an international kind of status quo that has prevailed since then, I would say, in Libya, but a lot of international dynamics have since changed. Um, but for me, it's important to look at why all this happened. So what led to this level of internationalization to the, in the first place? Uh, I would say one thing is the deterioration of multilateral norms in general. The, the NATO intervention kind of happened in the heyday of liberalism. Uh, even the Canadians' engagement back then was based on this idea of responsibility to protect, which uh, spoke to the, their, their moral, I would say, place or their moral foreign policy. But since then, I would say that this has significantly broken down. So the multilateral norms are, are just no longer there. And you see that a lot of division, you see, you see that even in a lot of divisions at the Security Council level when it comes to Libya. So it's not just the US and Russia bickering. It's all of the other states that are on the P5 that actually this have core disagreements on certain things. And even e, this is also reflected in EU countries' differences. So France, uh, Italy, Germany all have different divisions uh, of how this should play out, particularly in Libya. And you see that reverberating also on vis a vis other foreign policy issues like Ukraine right now, for instance. The other dynamic I attribute to the Gulf, uh, the Gulf became a lot more assertive after 2011 uh, in, in the region, I would say, in its vicinity. Uh, this isn't to say that Libya is a neighbor uh, because it isn't, but they perceive the kind of Arab world as their sphere of influence. And that's part of the reason why they intervened the way they did. The way they did. Um, another dynamic is competitive bilateralism. So you see that in a lot of the negotiations that happen around Libya, they're not really centered on Libya. So when the U.S. is speaking to the UAE about Libya, they factor in Iran. Uh, when the French are speaking to the UAE about uh, Libya, they factor in their defense agreements with them. And that constrains a lot of the foreign policy that is Libya-centric. So a lot, of, So Libya kind of becomes low on the priorities of issues to be resolved and becomes just a card in negotiations. So there's very little that is tackled or, or approached in a Libya-centric fashion. And that's that's valid for, for most of the states really engaged. And it's part of the reason why, despite this heavy internationalization, none of the states actually managed to achieve sustainable mid-term to long-term goals. Um, the three remaining factors are, on the one hand, US retrenchment. We clearly see that over time from 2011 onwards, and I think it culminated with Afghanistan. You have Russian opportunism. You increasingly see that in in the past few years, but increasingly now also in Libya, uh, in, in Syria, and then Libya, and then also now Sub-Saharan Africa. And you see also Turkish expansionism, uh, with kind of Erdogan's foreign policy being also increasingly hawkish, and he's engaged in a kind of, was engaged at least in a competition with not just Russia and Syria, but also uh, the Gulf states, uh, primarily the UAE and Saudi Arabia in the Arab world. Uh, so this idea of Arab world hegemony in which state can elite that. So these are the kind of internationalization side of things. And what this meant is we had uh, different endeavors to broker fees that had different manifestations. And I would say they grew increasingly uh, narrow in how inclusive they were. So in the Libyan political agreement, when we first, when the, the, the transition first collapsed, you had somewhat of an inclusive uh, framework for resolving things. But uh, the focus was, again, on counterterrorism and migration. And that sidetracked a little bit the, uh, the focus of, the, uh, of actually the agreement afterwards. Then you had what was then spearheaded as an initiative by the Elysee of Macron, and which was this idea of a power sharing blueprint between Khalifa Haftar, which the French backed, 
uh, both uh, politically and militarily. And on the other hand, the GNA, the Government of National Accord, PM5, and this is a kind of the Paris Agreement was the main blueprint that remained the, the kind of focus of the international community up until 2019. In 2019, Ghassan Salami, who was then uh, the special envoy to Libya of the Secretary General of the UN, uh, had a different idea a little bit. He still endorsed this idea of a power sharing arrangement, but he wanted to go for a bottom up approach where Libyans would be able to speak to what they want, how they want to be governed, etc. But that process was upended by the launch of Khalifa Haftar's offensive on, uh, on the Western capital. And then after the ceasefire that was agreed by Russia and Turkey, we had again a new political process overlaying the others that I mentioned. And this one was called the, well, at least its political branch was called the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum. And the idea from that was to basically supplement it with two other, three other tracks, uh, one on military and one on uh, military issues and another on economic issues, because those are also, are also part of the story that I unfortunately couldn't tackle here. And uh, a human rights kind of angle to things because of the uh, mis injustices that were accumulated over the past 12 years, let's say. Uh, so those, those were the initiatives and the LPDF or the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum uh, was an attempt essentially to reshuffle the status quo. So uh, bring about a new government uh, in an interim period for uh, nine months that was then supposed to actually bring us to elections on the 24th of December of last year, which is when I was in Libya actually. And uh, that Libyan political dialogue forum had certain flaws to it, but again, we were plagued or, or the setback was this lack of follow-up over what was agreed basically, so the day after again. So something was agreed in March of last year, and then subsequently the follow-up from the international community was very, I would say, uh, weak and feeble, and that allowed different political parties and political blocs in Libya to weaponize, I would say, the, the roadmap. Uh, and this is part of the reason why we didn't get elections uh, on the 24th of December of, 20, of, of uh, last year. Uh, now, a lot of also sub-developments happened, which I unfortunately am not able to tackle, but most prominent amongst them is Khalifa Haftar ran as president, so shed his kind of military garments for a suit and decided to run. Another is that the interim uh, prime minister of the government of national unity, uh, which promised not to run at the Libyan political dialogue forum, decided to run, uh, kind of contravening the roadmap as well. And... Uh, another controversial figure, which hadn't made a which hadn't made a political comeback, and which maybe you've seen in the journalism or media, was Saif Gaddafi, the son of the former dictator, who made his political comeback by submitting a candidacy for the election. So these, this is part of the story about why the the elections didn't happen. And unfortunately, today we're caught in this idea where the UN is pushing for elections, uh, but the Libyan political players, most of them actually don't want elections because they benefit from this, I would say, unsustainable status quo. Um, and the question of our elections, the way out is, I think, uh, as thematically important as it is Libya uh, wise important. And this is what I'd like to, to end on. Uh, now I'm happy to receive questions about this or about any other facets that I unfortunately wasn't able to tackle. Uh, again, caveat, this was in no way exhaustive of what happened in the past. 12 years, but I did my best. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was uh, very, very dense and very interesting. The way we are going to work for the uh, question period is that if you look at the bottom of your screen, you have a QA and a uh, icon. Uh, if you click on that, you can type up your question and uh, I will be able to see them and I will read them out uh, to, um, to uh, Imad. While uh, hopefully a few of you can start uh, typing up questions, I'll ask a first question uh, to Iman to give to give people a few minutes to, to put in their questions. And we have about just over 30 minutes for this, so there's ample time for, for many questions. Um, I do realize uh, that we have one of the, the benefits of, of the pandemic is that we can organize events online. So we have people from all over the world and, and looking at the list of names, I recognize a few Canadian names. But many of the names, I don't recognize them, but I assume that there's a lot of people who are not from, from Canada, which is great. 
That being said, we are hosted by a Canadian university. And so I did want to pick up very quickly on, on the role that Canada played in the past and basically is not playing today. As you mentioned, Canada was uh, one of the top contributors, uh, probably after France and the UK at the time of Operation Unified Protector in 2011. A Canadian commander, uh, General Charles Bouchard, was in command of the NATO mission. Uh, we conducted a, a, a reasonably uh, strong proportion of the airstrikes, uh, et cetera. There was a ship off the coast of Libya. Uh, but Canada, uh, like some of its allies, but, but in particular here in Canada, we've completely forgotten about Libya collectively. Uh, the media, the government uh, really plays a minimal role. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, what would be your, 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 your reading of, of that? And do you think that there is a role that Canada could play at some point in the future um, in Libya? Okay, so my analysis for why Canada was prominent back then is attributed a little bit to the reasons I mentioned. Um, earlier uh, about it kind of being a middle middle ground middle ground for agreement between the Europeans and the Americans back then which had agreements about who would contribute what uh, to the NATO intervention as you know there were the 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 NATO intervention kind of fused different nationally led uh, interventions from the US from the UK from etc I think the Ca Canadian one was called operation mobile uh, but the problem uh, that I see in that is that, again, the Canada was not formulating its own foreign policy. It was acting as almost the, the, op, uh, the operator or the subcontractor for a broader uh, military operation that was launched with a, with a clear goal and which Canada both ideologically and militarily bought into. Um, and I think also militarily it had a bit of an edge in terms of its ability to deploy things uh, off the coast of Libya, so frigates, etc. And also in terms of its ability to deploy the um, the, the air, the C-18s that were deployed back then for uh, strikes and also the air refueling missions, which it contributed to. Uh, another fact is that because politics played into the appointment of, uh, back then I think his name was uh, Colonel Bouchard to the NATO, uh, to head the NATO operation, you saw, and this is something Obama even complained about after the intervention, is that the, the Europeans were often red carding a lot of the sorties, basically, uh, to cut costs because of disagreements, etc. Canada was not in a position to do that because the person heading the, the intervention was Canadian, so they did, couldn't red card any sorties. So that's part of the reason why also militarily it punched above its weight. But the moral of the story is, even if it, even if structurally it, it's kind of sandwiched between the Europeans and the Americans, that is something to actually leverage to punch above your weight. It shouldn't be something that is perceived as a constraint. And I think that's what, in a way, uh, is constraining Canada since then, is that neither the Europeans or the Americans have a clear plan of what to do. And therefore, the Canadians are not doing much, uh, basically. Even, unfortunately, the, the humanitarian focus, which we see uh, translate into maybe perhaps more publicized or more prominent humanitarian crises in, in uh, the Middle East, like Syria, like Yemen, etc. We don't see Canada as active, even on the humanitarian side of things in Libya, basically. Um, so I would say that it needs to just like it exceeded the peripheral role that a lot of people expected it to play back then, it could do that today. Structurally, the same things that allowed it to punch above its weight are, are arguably still existent today. And I'd argue even that after 12 years, the Libyans kind of have negative or more negative perceptions of uh, the Europeans, definitely, and also of uh, the Americans. So, But Canada doesn't have that baggage uh, basically, and I don't think a lot of Libyans are also aware of, of its role in 2011 to, to begin with, to, to pin the blame on it. So it has several uh, things in its toolbox that I can use to be more active today. Oh, that's great. Thank you. So that I thank everybody in the audience. We have, I think, nine questions that have come in. I'll ask them one by one, uh, but you can keep your answers uh, not too long because we'll, we'll, we have uh, quite a lot of questions to cover and more of them might, uh, might come in. So uh, first question uh, is on the views of ordinary Libyans uh, towards elections. Uh, 
you have a few a few thoughts on on that aspect yeah i mean i'm always i, I always walk on eggshells when we talk about uh, views of ordinary libyans because we're i mean we're a country in conflict and you you couldn't get two libyans to agree entirely on everything that happened uh timeline wise from 2011 onwards or even before 2011. um but i would say that right now for instance vis-a-vis -vis, let's say the elections we have a massive number of people that registered for these elections so you have people that are hungry for for change i would say that want to see a change in the political status quo now you can argue that some of them registered to vote to uh install particular figures. So it's not exactly a, a democratic kind of uh, engagement with this with this uh, vote, with this suffrage process, let's say. But I think that's still a positive in a way is that people still believe in change through the ballot box. And this is something which should be steered and, and arguably even capitalized on by the international community by setting proper rules of the game, which have been absent i would say since march of last year because there were rules of the game that were set up and then uh libyan factions expectedly i would say uh tried to bend them and unfortunately the the international community played into that and that's part of that was the symptoms of that i would say were were on the level of election the electoral the the constitutional basis for these elections which was arguably absent at best or or polarized very polarized or frail at worst so even if we had kind of round one of these elections i suspect that on the 25th of december the day after the suffrage they would have been heavily contested and i think also that the international community wouldn't have been in a position to rule on the legitimacy of the elections from how much the, the there was rule bending all over the place um but to go back to kind of the ordinary libyans the bulk of them suffer unfortunately what was absent from my kind of Net retelling of the story is the extent to which Libyans suffer today, uh, both from a humanitarian perspective. A lot of them have been displaced. A lot of them have been dispossessed. There's a massive number of, of uh, IDPs from Eastern Libya towards Western Libya, also a massive number of IDPs from Southern Libya, equally from Western Libya, both from localized conflicts, but predominantly, I would say the IDP the manufacturing of IDPs and the manufacturing of injustice, I, I would argue, statistically speaking, happened predominantly on the Haftar side of, of, uh, of territorial control, because his, his approach is you're either with me or against me, which is not exactly the way, uh, territorially speaking, regionally speaking, up it is in, in Western Libya, where conflicts are far more localized. Um, but in any case, yes, they do suffer. Uh, economically speaking, what a uh, hundred dinars was worth in 2011 is vastly different to what a hundred dinars is worth uh, today. And unfortunately, at the level of, let's say, uh, salaries, etc., what Libyans gain, things haven't changed all that much. So they've been heavily dispossessed, even economically speaking. Uh, that's aside all the injustices that I, that I mentioned. Uh, maybe you've seen on the media that we had mass graves in Tarhuna, uh, which the government of national accord was responsible for, and subsequently also Khalifa Haftar was responsible for it, exacerbating a localized problem. Uh, so all these issues that unfortunately aren't addressed through the current political compact or, or framework that exists. And that's part of the reason why I think the view that elections alone will solve all these issues, this bundle of, of problems that we have is, is not exactly backed by by, by anything uh, really, neither literature wise nor uh, nor contextually speaking in, in Libya. But again, people are power hungry for change and they want the elite out. So the elections are part of the equation for the solution. Yeah. Good, good points. Uh, interesting question here on the role of Tunisia. Uh, what role can it play in the crisis today? Um, is it involved? Is it in, does it support some of the actors in the in the current conflict? Okay, I may be a bit sentimental about Tunisia, and I think a lot of the Libyans that that kind of witnessed uh, the 2011 revolutions uh, are about the the story of, of Tunisia, and it's the recent developments. I would argue are quite unfortunate. Let's say, and that even the country that was successful at bringing about. I would say non-violent social movements introducing a 
political change, upending a status quo, etc. The, the Tunisia was the if Libya was kind of the the bad blueprint, let's say, for for a revolution or the bloody blueprint for a revolution. Tunis was the was the ideal example, and unfortunately, you see that even there, uh, 10, 10 or twelve years on, for reasons that are predominantly. Uh, domestic, but also uh, international. Latently, uh, you see the momentum for revolutionary change being being slowly slowly unraveling, really, uh, with the with the president now assuming effectively its dictatorship like uh, position or, or dictator dict dictator type powers. I, I'd say, and this might seem controversial, but at least that's the way I subjectively see it. Um, but going back to Tunisia as a country, I think it. It is in a position, and it, it it was in a position to play a very constructive role in Libya, which I think it was predominantly predominantly playing. Obviously, there is a certain securitized lens that it takes to Libya because of all the terrorism issues that I mentioned, a lot of smuggling happening between Tunisia and Libya. Uh, but there was a diplomatic position, and this is valid for a lot of the countries in the, I would say. Uh, Western neighborhood of, of Libya, perhaps not Egypt, but the country of the Maghreb, could could play. Uh, Morocco played the role in the Libyan political agreement. Tunisia wasn't uh, exactly engaged at that level, but it was still an interlocutor of choice, and it had a balanced, I would say, view to the Libyan situation, despite the fact that it was affected by by what was going on in Libya from a security perspective. Uh, and this is also something which is valid for Algeria. But I think the problem is sometimes at the level of the political elite heading these countries rather than on the population. And it's it's this and this would also apply to actually the main country on the eastern side of, of Libya, Egypt, uh, basically, where where we have friendly relationships with most Egyptians, etc. And we share a lot of, of uh, challenges. Uh, but I think the blueprints for governance are the ones sometimes that dictate what foreign policy choices exist. Uh, and that's what I'm afraid Tunisia right now uh, is slowly heading towards. It, it will lose this ability to be a credible balanced player if it if it transitioned mm -hmm. towards this current system. So yeah. But so far that hasn't happened. So <laughs> kudos to Tunis. <laughs> So there's a few questions on the issue of elections. Uh, you you talked a bit about them. Uh, what happened in in late 2021? Uh, so I I'll, I'll just pick one of those questions on elections. But I think the three or four that I saw are are mostly similar. I'll take the most straightforward one from from Hugh. Uh, hi Hugh. Uh, what is the likelihood of presidential legislative elections taking place in June as part of the UN roadmap and with the support of the special envoy? Um. At this stage, I think that no prominent domestic uh, Libyan player is working towards that blueprint. Uh, this is for several reasons. I think the sense of continuity was, was or, or, or preserving a sense of continuity after the 24th of December was lost. Uh, back until like late last year, the, the end point of most of the foreign policies towards Libya of I'll say Western countries, the end point was the 24th of December, and they didn't know uh, they didn't know what the alternative would be. So right now they no longer have a steering wheel, let's say, over what the transition will look like. So statements around the elections and the 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 the, the importance of them happening from December to, to June, I would say would would bring hollow at this stage for a lot of uh, Libyan political players and sometimes for also a lot of um, regional players, which didn't have that endpoint in their foreign policy making. So they were maneuvering beyond, let's say, the 24th of December. And you clearly see that right now in their engagement with Libyan domestic political factions, whose choices, politically speaking right now, are influenced by the positions of a lot of states in our neighborhood. And I'll single out primarily Turkey, Egypt, uh, the UAE, and uh, Russia in this in, in this regard, but also some of the countries in our in our neighborhood, which are caught up with their own idea of what a settlement should look like. So, for instance, Morocco is also pursue, pursuing a, a track that is similar to the LPA, Libyan Political Agreement, to, who, that was held in Sherat, the city in Morocco. So their preferred blueprint always involves kind of the House of Representatives and the High State Council uh, in Libya, one of which was the democratically elected 
parliament in 2014, whose legitimacy is, is very contested uh, domestically, and uh, the general, uh, the High State Council, which was kind of a rump legislative that existed before that. But the problem is these two bodies now, eight years on, are very despised <laughs> by Libyans. Like, Libyans are generally, like, genuinely sick of them. They really don't like them. And that's the part of the problem in terms of, I would say, not just Morocco, but most countries really foreign policy making nothing is bottom up at this stage most of them are dealing with political blocks if not at sometimes figures and you lost this i uh, this this momentum towards a bottom-up solution i would say after the national conference was appended so until a process that resembles that allows the the 2.5 even more libyans to express their views about how they want to be governed taps into young people, actually, because we're 60% youth as a country. If you define youth as under 32 or 35, we're a very young country. Until you tap into that constituency, you're not going to get get to a solution. And you also see that even in the political, I would say, spectrum of things, and that you're dealing primarily with above 60-year-olds. And that means that you're dealing with a very narrow constituency to begin with. Now, that might be structural, but the international community, unfortunately, plays into plays into that uh really so it is also guilty on that one but yeah so there's another question uh on on the role of ngos uh, and and i think i'd i maybe expand just a bit the question on the way that it's framed there can you tell us a bit about the role of civil society how it has evolved in libya since 2011 uh what role it has played or not uh in in the evolution of of you know politics in the country yeah, I mean, the, the, the story of NGOs kind of also mirrors, I would say, the, the, the bit of the story of the Libyan revolution. Um, I'm working right now on the chapter on, on youth, and part of the story of, of kind of civil society is, is the retelling of, of this civil society dimension of things. Because back in 2011 is when the civil society space opened up uh, in Libya in its, in its liberal meaning. There was civil society in the Gaddafi era, but that was... Russian type civil society it wasn't exactly very civil, nor was it very <laughs> representative, socially speaking. But uh, I would say that over time, uh, with the different rounds of conflicts that we experienced, both youth fragmented to a certain extent, and as a adjacently civil society to a certain extent fragmented in its ability to install change at a national level. So you see a lot of actually local initiatives happening sometimes by youth in a particular constituency or region, etc. But it's very difficult to uh, reclaim that space at a national level for the structural barriers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, some are trying, I'm not saying that uh, they aren't, but they, yeah, it's, it's difficult on that front. Uh, another factor which is Im important here to also take into account is the fact that, well, you have uh, civil civil society would ideally work or, or be able to work in a safe space and that's no right now it's no longer a safe space in Libya um, for a lot of the activities that civil society would introduce so instead a lot of the young people right now both for economic social reasons are going actually instead of mobilizing in a non-violent space like civil society going to penetrate securitized spaces like the military apparatus or the security apparatus is going to enroll in brigades some of them is for salaries others is because well they can maneuver even outside of the security sphere to gain weight politically socially etc uh, so unfortunately you see this downward trend in, in kind of civil society momentum in the country as the country progressively uh, fell uh, after the revolution or faced challenges after the revolution. And you see that right now mirrored in a, in a kind of militarized generation uh, a little bit. And obviously there are, there are disparities between people, I would say, that were born in the 90s, like for instance me, and then people that were born in the 2000s. Uh, so one third of, like two thirds of my life was under Gaddafi, another third uh, in the kind of post-revolution. For the others, they had far less agency over what they could do because they didn't have, like their, their coming about of maturity, political consciousness, et cetera, was after the revolution. So that's all they know. And unfortunately, yeah, that, that's still a situation that prevails to this day. Thank you. Uh, going back to the regional and international side, 
Uh, there's been some talk uh, in the media, uh, you know, about some kind of rapprochement. I'm a bit on the skeptical side, but it's it's it is uh, happening a bit between Turkey and the UAE, uh, and and Egypt on its own side too. What kind of impact can can that have moving forward? You think in in Libya? Yeah. So so as I mentioned, kind of links to what I mentioned. Two things I mentioned earlier. One of which is the foreign policy of these states was on the 24th of December, the end point, at least. Um, and there are also linkages are with direct individuals and political blocks, etc. So the way it's manifesting right now is is almost comical, because you see former enemies that who's comical at the level of maybe Turkey and the UAE, although their kind of understanding, uh, their coming about to an understanding is perhaps pragmatic from their perspective, but on the Libyan side. They're taking political decisions that don't make any sense to their constituencies, basically. So the the enemies of yesterday, the people that we mobilized to kind of counter because there was a narrative that we're fighting. Well, we're fighting the Turks, we're fighting the Syrians sent by the Turks, or we're fighting the Russians, etc. All those dynamics right now are are kind of gaslighting a little bit the population. But um, on a national, on a more national level. These states are actually kind of patronizing political factions, dictating what they will do right now in terms of and recrafting informally, I would say, and covertly a roadmap moving forward. And this roadmap at this stage, from my perspective, doesn't include genuine free and fair elections at any point. And that's part of the reason why earlier when I mentioned no political players actually working towards that, it's because a lot of these countries like thrive on this unsustainable, inherently fragmented status quo uh, it's not within their like it, it's not positive for them for Libya to have a sovereign state where well we'd be insulated from foreign intervention that's what they thrive on so arguably on that front they're working they're working very well that's their common goal uh, as we are increasingly fragmenting as a site uh, but yeah so that's that, that that I think that that but again that rapprochement as you pointed out I'm skeptical as well because it's almost a house of cards it's not very built on anything solid and their long term visions are not really uh, reconcilable in any way shape or form and Libya's the kind of low hanging fruit for those disagreements to uh reemerge on the foray so you could maybe see still economic deals between Turkey and the UAE and they would still fight in Libya that's arguably fine um so yeah i don't think that that political compact that they're trying to craft is very um is very sustainable but yeah thank you uh, there are three questions that in different ways touch on the relationship between uh the uh, gnu the government of national unity and the house of representatives and it's especially its speaker saleh uh, can you you touched on that a bit in your presentation, but but for these three questions, can you go a bit more in terms of the the root causes of the hostility and of the between the two sides, uh, and where do you think that might be heading? Uh, will uh, the HOR um, uh, be able to replace the government, uh, which is specifically one of the questions? Thanks. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously. I, I can't speak on behalf of them, but I, what I can say is point out to two trends, obviously, and these trends kind of predate even the the uh, the arrival of the government of national unity. So it's been the case since I would say 2015, 16 uh, on, onwards. Uh, a lot of this choreography that they have about differences is based on very short term interests that they're not happy about. In March of last year, when uh, or was it April? In, in March of last year, when this government came about, it was endorsed by the majority, uh, by a prevailing majority of those within parliament. It's only after the first round of we call it hassle in Libya, or I believe the word in English is consociationalism or something. Basically, I can't even pronounce it, but uh, it's basically the division or appointment of position on 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 the basis of communal identities, etc. And that's what we saw happening with this HOR. So now, a few months later, the relationship has soured. It soured, and I think it culminated in a withdrawal of confidence of the government of, in September of last year, without a quorum, but still kind of a critical mass within parliament. Um, now, the situation that exists is that there is a political bloc that uh, wants to reshuffle the government or appoint a new government, etc. It's not critical mass within parliament. And then the GNU PM has co-opted also 
I would say, a certain number of uh, MPs that benefit from him staying in power. And as I said, those are very short-term interests. So the alliances are fluid. You clearly see that certain MPs are changing almost their, their, the tune they're singing to on a weekly basis. So that could change quickly. But I would say right now, arguably, they benefit from this contemporary situation and that they all don't want to get to elections. They all want to stay in power. So whatever maneuvering that allows them to do that, they'll they'll come to a deal to. All the narratives, I would say, of like 2015 to now have, have entirely collapsed in terms of the rapprochement alignments between political parties. And that's why they're increasingly, locally speaking, a lot of people are despise these bodies right now and want the elections uh, as, a, as, a, as a way out almost. Um, so yeah, that's the contemporary situation vis-a-vis -vis these two. On the question of whether the government, uh, whether the HOR will be able to replace the government, uh, it depends what you mean by that. There's a precedent where the HOR just set up a new government and the just new government govern a rump kind of this rump government govern a part of the territory or, or pretend it's the govern a part of the territory. So that could happen, even if it's not a critical mass within the parliament that does that. Uh, but I think the problem that Aguila Sala specifically is facing right now is unlike last year where he could just draft laws unilaterally and make those the basis of, of elections. Right now, um, there's a critical block within the international community that if he wants to replace this, gov replace this government, he has to have this quorum within parliament, which right now he doesn't have. But as I said, that can change if that block perceives that it sits in Bet's interest for political survival to side with him. Uh, so all the interests are unfortunately very short term. That's aside the international dynamics that I mentioned earlier and what the foreign parties kind of dictate Libyan political players should do. But yeah, not a, not a great situation and not a climate that is conducive to the holding of elections is the broad narrative. Um... On the issue of uh, Haftar, uh, his health uh, has been uh, the sub subject of a bit of media coverage, his age. Um, any insights on his health? And uh, this is a bit of a crystal ball question, but what would happen if or when, I guess, at some point uh, he goes, uh, either because of death or just too much ill health? Yeah. So this is an interesting uh, di dynamic, not, not not for gossip around his health status, but I mean, he the guy is old, so he's bound to die relatively soon. Uh, from my perspective, the situation right now is actually massively different to what it was pre-2019, should he die. Uh, why? Because since kind of the collapse of his, of his war, his, his offensive, his, his idea of controlling the territory militarily, you clearly see that at this stage right now, his sons are heavily actually involved in the political negotiations that I mentioned are being spearheaded by states in the background. So you clearly see that one is handl handling almost the political side of things, uh, Bill Gassim, and then you have another one, uh, Saddam, which is handling the military side of things. And they've arguably right now even managed to meet with political players in Western Libya that totally refused to meet with them first. And then also are hosted by states that wouldn't have hosted Haftar's sons before that, because the image was a bit weird in what capacity is that is that happening. And unfortunately, I think it speaks to a trend, not just in Libya, but even in the broader sub-Saharan African region, where, where the idea of a military regime is being normalized. So the, 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 this idea of hereditary succession is, is normalized. So unfortunately, even the laws for elections that we had last year that were accepted point blank by the international community gave powers to like a, a, it was an all-powerful presidency and an all-powerful presidency at this stage is bound to have a militarized angle to it so arguably what you're talking about is a military regime or a military dictatorship and this is valid for all the players but again to go back to Haftar a situation pre-2019 in terms of his sons being able to consolidate control over the troops or the Libyan Arab armed forces so to speak and maintain the the a degree of cohesiveness over that amalgam of forces in eastern and southern Libya right now is massively different. What could make also this change is if, uh, and these are negotiations that are currently happening, if Haftar and his sons are allowed to again centralize economic patronage, because that's, as I mentioned, part of the story. If they 
are allowed to uh, control rent or control revenues in a way where they can make local communities, again, dependent on them for dispersing that, which is what they're working towards, then these sons, once their father died, will be able to actually, I would say, maintain a degree of coherence to, to the troops that he has. Uh, and that's a long-term problem. And personally, I see that it's states that are actually hosting uh, Saddam, et cetera, that are uh, like Haftar sons that are responsible after kind of hosting Haftar in 2017-16. It's now his sons that are being brought to the fore. So it's only a matter of time, I think, at some point where we see uh, his sons emerging kind of as political military uh, players, which which is a bad precedent. Uh, bad precedent to be set for Libya and is also part of the reason why we had the 2011 revolution in the first place. So, yeah. So we have two minutes left. So I'll ask you uh, pretty much the most difficult uh, question to finish uh, and, and really uh, in advance, good luck answering it in two minutes. But with apologies to the uh, eight other people who have questions, uh, unfortunately, we, we won't have time to look at all of them. Some of them touched on elements that we touched on so far. So very briefly, what should be done? A uh, very good question from Florence. What should be done, ideally, if you had control on this, uh, to stabilize the situation in Libya? Okay. Well, I mean, don't play to my dictator impulses, but uh, I think, like the policy analyst side, the like more recommendations to the international communities, there needs to be a, a rules of the games that are set up. Basically, there needs to be. You need to acknowledge that there needs to be a new roadmap. Trying to salvage the like what what existed or the carcass of the political process from last year is problematic for several reasons. Uh, and I think you need to position yourself in a place where if elections are supposed to happen, uh, they should happen as part of a larger process, first of all, both before and after uh, these elections. But also more importantly is also, you should kind of position in your, yourself in a way where you can rule on their legitimacy. Uh, that's another thing because that, these two factors were completely absent last year. There was just the 24th of December date. No idea what should, idea, well, a certain idea of what should happen before, which was arguably ignored and, and kind of pushed down the, like the can was kicked down the road and no idea what would happen afterwards. And more broadly, the elections weren't part of anything procedurally speaking uh, that was solid, let's say, or tangible. And right now you can tap into top, the popular momentum of two and a half million people that want to vote and despise the elite that you're actually engaging with. So don't recycle them, uh, basically, because right now that's what's happening, unfortunately. It, it is, it, it's that they are being recycled. There's a reason that we had in a country of six million people, 94 candidates for the presidency or, or, or so, basically. And all of them, it was like a royal rumble of all the players from the past 10 years who had names that were uh, involved in the NTC, the National Transitional Council of 2011, to uh, today. All of them wanted a piece of the presidency, and that's for a reason. Uh, it's because it was the, the system was inherently flawed. They weren't there to introduce reform, with a few exceptions, but I think I speak for the vast majority of their, of their worldview uh, when it comes to their intentions of Libya. So, yeah, hopefully that I tried to answer that <laughs> question the best I could. An easy question to answer in two minutes. Uh, unfortunately, again, with apologies to the uh, seven or eight people who still have uh, questions, uh, we will have to stop. I do want to thank everybody who attended. We had about 60 people uh, in attendance, uh, uh, which is uh, which is great. Um, obviously, many thanks to Imad for, for your time and for sharing your very interesting insights on the situation in Libya. And of course, thank you very much to the uh, staff at SIPS, Andrew, who... Uh, um, uh, on the technical side made this possible. Anna uh, on the coordination side of SIPS who joined the event uh, a while ago, uh, thank you. And of course, uh, the uh, students who work with Anna too. On that, thank you very much to everybody. If you are not uh, subscribers to the SIPS uh, newsletter, I strongly suggest that you do. You can Google University of Ottawa SIPS, C-I-P-S, Center for International Policy Studies, and just subscribe to the newsletter for uh, other events. And last thing I'll say is that the next Middle East event, not the next SIPS event, but the next Middle East event that I will be organizing in a few weeks will be on Yemen.
uh, which is usually a, a topic that we cover about once a year at SIPS. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to that one too. On that, thank you very much. Have a good day. And if you're in Canada, enjoy the minus 25 uh, that we are enjoying uh, right now. Thank you. Thanks a lot to everyone attending. Thanks to SIPS and to you, Thomas. Take care.